Chapter 16 State Visit to Liberia Towards the end of 1952, I received an invitation from President W. V. S. Tubman to pay a visit to Liberia. He was kind enough to offer to send his yacht, the President Edward J. Roy, to come for me and bring me back. As it was not possible to make any further headway with constitutional reform until April, when the views of various organizations were due, the more I thought about a change of scene and a breath of sea air, the more attractive the idea became. My ministers and party executive members were unanimous in their advice to accept the invitation, so I decided that I would discuss the matter with the governor. You certainly look as if you could do with a rest, Prime Minister, His Excellency said as he looked thoroughly, sorry, thoughtfully, into my face. But I wonder if you will get much out of that state visit. The same thought had occurred to me, but at least I would get three days sea trip to Liberia and three days back in which to relax on the yacht. Also, if I did not take the opportunity then, it would probably be years before I would be able to get away again, if things moved in the country as I hoped they would. So I decided to accept the invitation. On a morning in mid-January 1953, therefore, I set out for Takaradi, where the President's yacht was waiting. I have no idea how many people accompanied me, but there was certainly a boatload of them, and a surprising number flew at their own expense to welcome me in Liberia and join in on the occasion. On the outskirts of Takaradi, the car was brought to a standstill by crowds of people dancing and singing, mothers with small babies tied to their backs, swaying their hips to the rhythm of the drumming, young children with a look of deep concentration on their small faces as they imitated the action of their elders, men and women of all ages arrayed in their most colourful cloths, were clashing cymbals, beating drums and laughing and singing. When we eventually arrived at the docks, there was more ceremony to be observed, speeches of good will and wishes for a safe journey, the pouring of libations and handshaking. The Dutch captain welcomed me as I stepped aboard and introduced me to his old Dutch crew. I was shown into the president's suite, which I shared with Kojo Bozio. Have you ever seen such a luxury on the high seas? I asked Kojo when left to ourselves we examined our surroundings. I threw myself onto one of the beds with a sigh of pleasure and delight. It was a mistake, I thought, to provide me with such a comfortable bed. The way I felt, I would never want to leave it until I arrived in Monrovia. I must have been the only one feeling in need of such relaxation, however, for as soon as the rest of my entourage had acquainted themselves with the geography of the yacht, one by one they opened my door to see what had happened to me. They were most concerned to see me lying on my bed, apparently comatose, and asked if I was feeling ill. They could not believe that I was just wary, for nobody seems to think that I get tired. I am an automaton that is wound up in the morning and needs neither food nor sleep. When the spring runs down, I simply wind it up again. And so I gave the spring a wind and went out to join everybody else. They appeared to have made themselves very much at home, drinking and shouting in order to make themselves heard above the sound of the radiogram which somebody had discovered and which was never allowed to rest for the whole of the trip. I have always been keenly interested in boats, and it was not long before I had cornered the captain and was firing questions at him about the President Edward J. Roy. The yacht was named after the first all-black president of Liberia, who was elected in 1870. It is of 463 tons and was bought in Holland a few years ago when the president, in his go-ahead manner, 
had recognized the necessity of traveling along the coast instead of relying on the dust tracks that formed most of the country's highways. These, during the rainy season, were often quite impassable. In fact, sir, the captain said, with a smile and a salute, this is the president's navy. I can't wait to get my own navy in that case, I declared. At the moment, my navy consists of a very gallant but badly equipped fleet of fishing boats. I made a mental note about yachts in Holland and amused myself for some time by thinking up a suitable name for the boat I had in mind. In spite of the general activity pervading the yacht, I felt quite rested by the time we arrived at the port of Monrovia. This was fortunate, for in my wildest imaginings I had never visualised such a reception as had been prepared. The President and the Vice President with their ladies, members of the House of Representatives and the Senate, high government officials, chiefs and a cheering crowd of onlookers were all waiting at the port. After shaking hands all round, we set off in state procession through the streets of Monrovia. As I looked around it, it became increasingly difficult to believe that this was the same city that I had visited in 1947. I said so to President Tubman, who was sitting by my side, and congratulated him on the development that had taken place during his term of office. Prior to his election as... Uh, president, Liberia was far from being an encouragement and an incentive to countries aspiring to independence. Even today, there is much to be done in the Republic to make it a model independent state in West Africa. For the roads are about the worst that I have seen in any country, and without good roads, the hinterland is cut off from the coastal belt. There is also much evidence of poverty among the masses, even in Monrovia itself. But with the greatest will in the world, such improvements take time, and when I saw how much had been done in that short space of five years, I felt that with President Tubman at the helm for another five or ten years, Liberia could solve many of her difficulties. One thought then struck me very forcibly. If Liberia, with her limited resources, of about two million pounds at that time, could manage to govern herself. There was indeed hope for the Gold Coast with a revenue of over 36 million pounds. My program was a very full one, but carefully planned so that I was able to see every aspect of life in the country. I addressed both houses of the legislature, visited almost all the government departments and was shown how they operated, went around the iron mines, visited the homes of Gold Coast people resident in Liberia, and attended receptions, garden parties, and several nightclubs. The pace of their hospitality was such that in each moment of leisure, I felt as if I had just stepped off a roundabout. One day, the president invited me up to his country villa at a place called Totota, which is 60 miles inland from Monrovia. The villa and the surrounding country were so beautiful that it was well worth the bumpy and dusty trip we made by road, there and back. Luckily, it had not been raining, otherwise I doubt whether we would have got through. A most sumptuous luncheon had been laid on, to which all the chiefs had been invited. There must have been about a thousand people there altogether, I suppose. Mrs. Tubman, a quiet and unassuming lady, was tireless in her attention to guests and seemed to have the knack of being everywhere at once without being in the least obtrusive. It was a most enjoyable reception. Both the British Embassy staff and the Gold Coast people resident in the country held receptions in my honour. I made a number of speeches, but the most memorable and the one that I enjoyed delivering more than any other was made without notes or preparation at a mass meeting held at the Centennial Pavilion in Monrovia. I knew from past experience that the sight of a crowd before me was all I needed to encourage the words to flow. I knew, also, 
that such a speech would be composed of words from the heart, words that the people wanted to hear and would remember. As I stood up to speak, I could sense the tension of the crowd. That brief moment of suspense, when it seemed as if a wave of the hand, with a wave of a hand, I could, like a hypnotist, control every action and every emotion of the people before me, was the most vivid memory of my trip to Liberia. I spoke on the vision that I see. I began by thanking the people of Liberia for the wonderful reception that they had accorded us and conveyed to them that the greetings of the chiefs and the peoples of the Gold Coast. I had visited the State Department, the Treasury and other government departments, I told them, and had seen how the machinery of the Liberian Republic worked. If you will allow me to muse a little over what I saw, I said, it is better to be free to manage or mismanage your own affairs than not to be free to mismanage or manage your own affairs. This was greeted with loud applause. It was this spirit which really motivated me when in 1949, in the heyday of our agitation in the Gold Coast, I founded a newspaper. The name of the newspaper is the Accra Evening News and listened to the motto of that paper, we prefer self-government with danger to servitude in tranquility. Both the past and present achievements in Liberia, I said, were proof enough that the African is capable of governing himself. I judged Liberia not from the heights it had reached, but from the depths from whence it had, came, it had come. Those who wanted to enslave Liberia have enslaved themselves, I declared amidst resounding cheers. I pointed out that it was Providence that had preserved the Negroes during their years of trial in exile in the United States of America and the West Indies, that it was the same Providence which took care of Moses and the Israelites in Egypt centuries before. A greater exodus is coming in Africa today, I declared. And that exodus will be established when there is a united, free and independent West Africa. Look at the whole country of Africa today. With the possible exception of Liberia, Egypt and Ethiopia, the entire continent is divided and subdivided, partitioned and repartitioned. Look at the map, I declared indignantly. The continent looked like a patchwork quilt each colour representing the interest of a foreign power. I was getting into my stride and receiving as much encouragement from the enthusiastic crowd as I did from my own people at the arena in Accra. Africa for the Africans, I cried. Africa for the Africans, but not the kind of philosophy that Marcus Garvey preached. No, we are bringing into being another Africa for the Africans with a different concept. And that concept is what? I paused for a moment. A free and independent state in Africa. We want to be able to govern ourselves in this country of ours without outside interference. And we are going to see that it is done. My words were lost in a roar of acclamation and it was several minutes before it was quiet enough for me to proceed. I pointed out that a people without government of their own was silly and absurd. It was important, therefore, to forge ahead and develop our respective countries, both politically and economically. We should aim at an even greater glory and majesty than that which existed in the days of ancient Ghana, the land of our forebears. I explained that long before the slave trade and the imperialistic rivalries in Africa began, the civilizations of the Ghana Empire were in existence. At that time, in the ancient city of Timbuktu, Africans versed in science, arts and learning and were having their works translated into Greek and Hebrew and were, at the same time, exchanging teachers with the University of Cordova in Spain. These were the brains, I declared proudly. And today they come and tell us that we cannot do it. We have been made to believe that we can't do it. But have you forgotten? 
You have emotions like anybody else. You have feelings like anybody else. You have aspirations like anybody else. And you have visions. So don't let people come and bamboozle us that the African is incapable of governing himself. As instances of African who had already proved their capabilities to the world, I instanced Af- Anthony William Amu, professor of philosophy at the University of Berlin, and Toussaint Louverture, a hero in the field of battle. We believe in the equality of races. We believe in the freedom of the peoples of all races. We believe in cooperation, in fact. It has been one of my theses that in this struggle of ours, in the struggle to redeem Africa, we are fighting not against race and colour and creed. We are fighting against a system. A system which degrades and exploits, and wherever we find a system, that system must be abolished. Yes, we believe in peace and cooperation among all countries, but we also abhor colonialism and imperialism. We abhor man's inhumanity against man. We must learn to live together. The age of aristocracy is gone. God made all of us equal. If you can create a state and create a government for your people, then it is for the state to see to the interests of that people. You leaders of Liberia have done a lot for your people. I then illustrated to the people how we of the Gold Coast felt that we had played our part in making our country's history. I recall the Bond of 1844, which gave Britain a political footing in the country and the forming of the Fanti Confederation in an effort to oppose British imperialism. What was the result? I asked. They were arrested and charged with treason. Then the Aborigines Rights Protection Society was formed to fight against their land being taken away. The result was that today the land belonged to the chiefs and the people of the Gold Coast. Then came the National Congress of British West Africa, which, because of the machinations of some of its members, was allowed to fall into disrepute. Twenty years ago, a man came to the country called Agre. He said, You look back. Don't mind what is happening, or don't mind what has happened. A new day is coming, when the youth of Africa is going to wake up and that reawakening is going to be a challenge to civilization. I related the story of my return to the Gold Coast to be secretary of the United Gold Coast Convention and how in a few months the whole country became politically awakened and all were demanding in one voice their liberation from British rule. Then, speaking of present affairs, I went on. So now we have arrived at a new stage. We have put our case to Britain. At the last conference of my party, the whole of the Gold Coast people have been united on one ground, the sovereignty and independence of the Gold Coast. The Gold Coast is going to have a new name, not Gold Coast, because this gives us memories of the past, but a new one, Ghana. And here mark you a sovereign and independent state, but within the British Commonwealth, because we still associate ourselves with what Britain has done. We are not ungrateful beasts. We shall continue to be friends if and when we are managing or mismanaging our own affairs. I told them that the campaign for United West Africa had begun and that all the various territories on the west coast of Africa should now think in terms of unity and solidarity with one another. It was only by uniting the people that we would be able to hold our own in the world that we would demand respect from other nations because we would have this force behind us. I summarised what I had said in a few words and added my thanks for their hospitality. Long live the Republic of Liberia. The fortnight of extravagant celebrations was over. As I joined in the dancing of the people at the dock who came to bid us farewell, I realised how much both I representing the Gold Coast people and the Liberians, had learnt about one another. 
Although through circumstances outside of our control, they had been educated by the Americans and my people had been educated by the British and those between our frontiers had been influenced by the French, it now seemed very clear that we all belonged to one family and we were all anxious for one big reunion of that family. The engines of the President Edward J. Roy started up. Last minute farewells and messages were called as the Gulf of Water widened and soon we had our last glimpse of Liberia and its warm-hearted people. So we returned to Takaradi. Again the reception from my own people was something to remember. Never have I seen such a mass of people. They were almost delirious with excitement, waving arms, flags or garments, singing and shouting dancing and drumming. Looking down on them, I felt giddy at the sight. With the swaying of the bodies to the rhythm of the drums, it was as if we were about to disembark onto a moving raft in a strong swell. And their welcome was in evidence all along the 165 miles to Accra, where flags and signs of welcome were hoisted across the road and villagers came out in their gayest of cloths to shout freedom. Welcome and Aquaba.